Hello and welcome back to Politics and Polls. I'm Julian Zelizer, Professor of History of Public Affairs uh, at Princeton University, and this is my co-host and colleague, Sam. Yes, good morning. So this week we're going to turn to the media, the big elephant in the room during any discussion of the election, the news media from the New York Times to CNN to internet sites like Vox and Real Clear Politics and podcasts. They don't just report on the election, but they are major forces in how the election unfolds. This is what media scholars like to write about. Some critics have argued that this year the media literally made Donald Trump without the free airtime that he received in the primaries. He might not have won. There's others who've looked at the ways in which sexism has impacted the coverage of Hillary Clinton as reporters pay attention to parts of her campaign, like her voice uh, or what she wears, that's absent in coverage from male candidates. Bernie Sanders supporters argue that the media was corporate owned and wasn't interested in covering many issues that he cared about, although his campaign did pretty well. And we've also heard more about the way in which the social media, uh, things like Twitter, are changing the basic dynamics of the campaign. And one of the big issues I thought we could talk about today that a lot of social scientists talk about and journalists increasingly is how do you tell the basic story of the election? What should the media look at in the coming months? And there seems to be, Sam, two different approaches, I'd say, to this debate. One is the game change faction that argues the way to cover campaigns is to get out on the campaign trail, to look for critical turning points and to understand the people behind the campaign and get a feel for what's going on in the electorate and to focus on gaffes or crisis moments like some would say Donald Trump has faced in the last few days. And then you have this other quantitative faction that has been increasingly present in the media uh, and in, in the social sciences that say you have to, you have to look at quantitative data, you need to look at the fundamentals uh, in polling and how the economy is doing and approval ratings to understand where things are going and we shouldn't get so distracted by the day in and day out events that we like to watch at least if you're watching television or seeing things on the internet. So I thought this would be an interesting conversation. It's pretty much the premise of the podcast and I'm curious Sam how you see this, especially after a week like we've just had post-convention where Donald Trump every day seems to do something dramatic. How, how should we think of covering and looking at these campaigns? Well, let's see, Julian. This is a great topic. Um, let me back up a little bit and um, talk about how I look at the role of quantitative data generally, uh, which I think you've already described pretty well. So roughly speaking, I view what happens in terms of storytelling as having multiple components. And I think of it as roughly being like, uh, say, reporting from a disaster scene or reporting on the weather. So if you're reporting on a hurricane, then the reason we care about hurricanes are life and uh, communities being hit by the hurricane. We care about, say, property that might be damaged. We care about the consequences long term of that hurricane. But at the same time, we also care about the hurricane itself, where it's going to go what the wind speeds are like, what the temperature is like, and so on. And the reason I'm making this analogy is that that's a field where weather forecasting is, in fact, quite advanced, and it's possible to, to do amazing things in that, in that domain. And I would characterize political statistics as a field that is uh, much more in its infancy, where there's starting to be an understanding of how to do these things well from a numerical point of view. Um, and I think there's starting to be an understanding of how storytelling of the traditional type fits with this other kind of uh, forecasting. So for instance, uh, someone who's uh, reporting on a hur hurricane site might want to know how bad the hurricane's going to be, might want to know where it's going to strike, and so on. And the way I would think of it is this. Um, traditional re political reportage is focused on the reasons that we care about politics, uh, people, their stories, the candidates, events that may happen. And those stories are the reason that people are paying attention, such close attention this season because it's such a crazy season, and all these events. In the meantime, the measurements are available. And now you created one large category of quantitative data where you refer to polls and fundamentals. I would actually break that out a little bit. I would break that out uh, into 
quantitative factors that we think we understand for driving races. That can be things like economic factors, unemployment, uh, GDP growth, and so on. And so we think that we understand how those relate to voting. But, you know, sometimes they don't, right? I mean, like just an example would be political science scholarship that said the party decides who's the no who the nominee is going to be. And as of September or November last year, there is no way it was going to be Donald Trump based on that kind of research. So that's one kind of knowledge where we, you know, we mostly know what's true or we think we know what's and true. And that means, so that means, you know, endorsements from the party, where the major donors were giving money. Yeah. That was the where the parties matter kind of argument that all that still will ultimately determine who wins these primaries. Yeah, and you know those ideas are still valid in the sense that they describe what a working party does. Uh, it, evidently, what we have on our hands this year is one party that's working pretty normally and another party that is not working normally. And so that scholarship is useful because it set expectations so that now we know what's surprising, as opposed to using it as a hard predictive tool, which is, I think, what some people tried to do. So that's one kind of tool. And then the other kind of tool is uh, what I personally specialize in, which is the use of pure polling data without those fundamentals or other factors. And so what I try to do is to continue the analogy some more. Um, I try to basically reduce polls to a single measure that's like a thermometer, where if you want to know uh, what's happening in the race, you can consult that electoral thermometer and say, oh, it looks like Hillary Clinton's win probability is 80%. Looks like she would today win um, 320 electoral votes on, ele on election day would be pretty similar. And so that electoral thermometer can provide a backdrop. It, it's not that it replaces the reporting, it's that it tells you what happens. So if you're watching, say, the Republican convention and you think, wow, uh, I don't know what to think of that. I've never seen a convention quite like that before. Well, I, what do other people think? And then you can go and look at some numbers and say, oh, uh, looks like other people didn't like it very much. Or, you know, likewise, you know, the Democratic Convention. Um, there are people who said that that was an extremely well put together event, that there were stars making speeches every night. Surely that's going to have a giant effect. Uh, well, if you look at the numbers, the effect was a bounce for the Democrats of seven points, which is, yeah, pretty big by modern standards, but not as big as it's been in the last 50 years. So why is that? And so I view numbers as a way that one can objectively measure what happened as a consequence of an event, but scribes are still going to decide what the interesting events are, and sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. I mean, it is certainly the yeah. case that talking heads sometimes don't detect what the interesting event is at the time, right? It, like, just to pick an example, uh, Captain Khan and his, uh, Captain Khan's parents, mm -hmm. who ap appeared last week at the Democratic Convention to such great effect, um, Fox News cut away from that, right? They, they oh, yeah, some guy looks like a Muslim guy. Yeah, let's yeah. turn away from that. And so that's an example of somebody making a decision about what's interesting to cover. And in some sense, they were wrong. And, uh, and so I think that there's this, um, uh, I, I think both kinds of information can make mistakes, but I, I, I just put them in somewhat different boxes as to what they're good for. It's created, I'm, I've talked to reporters who say that there is more, for reporters, it's more of a tension that's emerged. So I was talking with some people at the New York Times who said that in the newsroom, there's a real division. And I don't know if this is accurate or not, but between the people who do the upshot, which is the online uh, section of the newspaper that really focuses on some of what you're talking about, versus the you know reporters like Jonathan Martin who covers the campaign and is on the trail all the time because for them there's a, a more of a difference in how they think that ultimately you could you know you get the best coverage of what what's going on i mean there's literally the people on the ground and then there's the people who don't do that kind of reporting and are really looking at the data and it seems for a while what we've had is a, a tension between them and what you think, at least, are suggesting, which is nice to hear, is that there are ways to weave these two together. I've heard about such tensions at the Times. I think, if I understand correctly, I think there was somewhat more tension in the early years of this when Nate Silver first went over uh, from his independent site and, and joined the New York Times staff. And I think you know some of that was jealousy because so much of the traffic went to 538 during the 2012 campaign. Um, I can detect it sometimes because it's sometimes hard to detect uh, 
the usage of data or knowledge of trends when reading the work of individual writers at the Times. I should interject at this moment that for people who are not professional media people, it is often interesting to see who wrote a story at the Times. And so one might care about whether it was uh, Martin who wrote a piece or Benjamin Applebaum or what have you. What I will say is that um, I you mean I'm because sorry. of differences in how they do the coverage, or yeah, different tone, who their sources are. I mean, yeah. just for just p to pick an example, uh, on the conservative side, one of my favorite writers is Robert Costa at the Washington Post, and I know that he has sources, and I know that they trust him, and I know that that he gets to talk to people who are the voices of, say, I don't know, the House Republican Caucus. And so when, whenever Robert Costa writes something, I read it. So an example at the New York Times would be Binyamin Applebaum. He wrote, um, I forget who else was involved in it, but I remember his name being at the top of the story. Uh, he, was, uh, he wrote a long piece reported from, I think, um, I believe Pennsylvania, and it was about people who were out of work, people who were Trump supporters. And that was fascinating. It was just amazing reportage. And I was really absorbed in it, and I felt that he really had uh, his finger on the pulse of what people were talking about in that area. And, you know, he, and some of those are areas where a New York Times reporter is not the most trusted person. Uh, who, you know, he shows yeah. up. I'm from New York City. and I Because of the um, perceived bias of the paper. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, so I, I see that as being really incredible reportage. And so and another example of great reportage is this piece that I've talked about before, which is a piece using American Community Survey data to look at county be county by county support uh, for Trump. And that was a piece that appeared in the upshot that Neil Irwin and Josh Katz wrote. And that was an amazing piece of reportage. And I will say that those two pieces together provide different views of kinds of people who are drawn to this bizarre insurgent candidacy that has taken over one party. And so I think that those two kinds of reportage can work together. Um, I think the thing that bothers me the most is when a, a, a reporter writes something that is clearly at odds with data. So an example of that would be, say, if somebody attends a campaign rally and they say, oh, I can feel that Mitt Romney has momentum. And uh -huh. you can feel it. I, I remember John Dickerson wrote a, a, a piece, I think it was for Slate. I, from, I forget where he was writing at the time. Yeah. Um, but he wrote exuberantly about all the momentum that Mitt Romney clearly had. And all the data pointed towards there being no momentum for either candidate, maybe some momentum actually for Obama. But here's this reporter at a campaign rally for one of the candidates saying that he felt momentum. Well, you know, what he felt was that evidently that candidate was having a good rally. And that's different from momentum. And so I, I think that it would be, you know, it's kind of like standing in the eye of a hurricane and saying, well, things seem pretty calm around here. Um, and I think that there are ways that data can be used well. And what I would love to see is to see data play a role like having an air pressure gauge or a, um, a barometer or a thermometer when you're out reporting the weather. I mean, you know, yeah. something's going to happen. And there's some geek with numbers saying, well, you know, um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, we're going to be close. Why don't you go there? Uh, I think, I mean, one interesting thing is the campaigns are becoming more sensitive to what you're saying. And so in 2008, it was a big thing when David Axelrod, who was advising President Obama, really was pretty steadfast in saying not to be distracted at every moment by the way the news might shift on the kind of question you're talking about. You know, candidate X has momentum or this is all falling apart. And the campaign was built around that attitude toward the media. And I think yeah. a lot of the Clinton people are saying the same thing. It's it's pretty important right now, especially given because of Trump, the nature of the dramatic media coverage. It's probably more dramatic than we have ever seen it, uh, given the candidate himself. Yeah, I'll, I think that's right. Let me give uh, just a couple of examples of recent events that I think might have been covered a little bit differently yeah. with a little bit more quantitative information. So I think a few days ago, Mitt Romney was quoted as saying that if Trump wins, it's going to be uh, a narrow win. And if um, Hillary Clinton wins, it could be a narrow win or it could be a blowout. And I saw a headline that interpreted this as Mitt Romney coming around on Trump's candidacy. Uh -huh. That is not what Romney is doing there. Right. Turns out, as far as I can tell, Romney is a really good data guy. He's seemingly good with numbers. I don't, I've never met the man, but he, like, it seems like he's good with numbers. It seems like he knows what's going on. And whatever his means are for understanding what's going on, he is correct that if Trump wins, it's going to be a really narrow win. And if, uh, as is more likely, Hillary Clinton wins, it could be a blowout. And that's the range of possible outcomes. And this is a man who has a lot of campaign data. and He knows the Electoral College about as yeah. probably as well as anybody living. Um, and, and so he's not 
making a claim of a claim about who he'd like to win. He's making a claim of what the weather's like, and that was I thought um, exactly right on his part. So so I think another example would be um, when the Trump campaign goes to uh, Maine and they say, oh well, looks like he thinks Maine is in play. But if you look at the numbers, well, a Maine's not really in play. B uh, Maine assigns electoral votes by congressional district, and there is one congressional district that might be in play. He didn't go to that congressional district. And so what that tells you is that actually the Trump campaign doesn't seem to be very quantitative in its approach. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I can't imagine I'm surprising anybody listening uh, to say that they don't seem to have a clear quantitative strategy for winning because their appearances, the things that the candidate says, um, don't have very much connection to electoral reality. Uh, if he were strategic, he'd be spending all his time in, uh, I don't know, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Ohio. That's where he'd be. And, you know, he's Maine in a Democratic district. Yeah. Well, he's defined. I mean, he's openly defying the data, and, and it's based probably on the promise of nothing. But he's like, saying yes. he's going to flip states like New Jersey or New York just well, like, on personality yeah. and force. And now, now he says, uh, I'd be curious about your take on this. Uh, one of the big stories recently is him saying to Sean Hannity on Fox that he thinks that the election might be rigged, and he's concerned about that. And and there's been a big reaction about what a destabilizing statement that is, and it's been making waves for a few days now. Um, what do you make of that statement about vote rigging, which is an example of uh, a candidate statement colliding with the media? Well, the first part is there is vote rigging. It's just not the kind he's talking about. So the, the real vote rigging story has been on voting uh, restrictions that have been put into place over the last uh, decade, two decades, and, and recently there's been some court decisions that favor voting rights. So if there was a coverage of vote rigging, that would probably be the more interesting story and how that's going to play out in, in some states, whether that in any way that can help a Republican who's struggling. Uh, but, you know, that's a, it's a, a statement that, you know, is, is useful to Donald Trump right now uh, to give the perception that what you're seeing in the media is not necessarily the story and it obviously sets up uh, his loss and a way to either make the loss illegitimate or to give a narrative that offers him room after the election to keep doing things and not looking like a disastrous political figure uh, but it's gonna get a lot of attention and you know, the, that, that's what I guess I started with. It, the, the media is attracted to these kinds of stories, and I'm not always critical. I, I understand why. It's hard when you have a candidate going out there saying, this is rigged, this is not fair, uh, to either ignore that or downplay it. I guess the bigger question is how do you tell, as a reporter, the story of why that's significant, uh, why it's either just bluster or why those kinds of accusations can actually have an impact either on the election or how the public sees it. Right. But given how, you know, that is a story, given how Trump supporters mm -hmm. think of their candidate, that could be important. You don't want you know, millions of voters uh, ultimately feeling and thinking that this, can, this campaign was not legitimate. We've seen a lot of that with President Obama already and some of his opponents who made those arguments. Uh, One so, of which is Donald Trump which is Donald Trump. This is an argument he's been making for a long time. And he's used this repeatedly, though. He did this against Ted Cruz in the Iowa primary. It was one of his opening gambits against him when he lost to say it was rigged and that uh, Ted Cruz had cheated. Uh, and this is uh, it's a familiar argument for, yeah. for Donald Trump. So ballpark, I would say, um, one way to gauge the long-term impact of this is to think in terms of the numbers. So uh, I'll just say parenthetically that I'm not noticing uh, Republican officials taking out the banner of vote rigging that uh, after he yeah. said it. But uh, ballpark, if I had to place a bet on a narrow range of vote outcomes, I would bet right now on Trump getting 40 to 42 percent of the popular vote in November. You know, now I could be wrong about that. Uh, if you go to election.princeton.edu, um, that expresses more uncertainty. But I'm just as an observer. My own observations of the data suggest 40, 42% of the vote. Um, but if you think back to the to the primaries, Trump was consistently at about 40% of Republican voters who felt that he was their first choice. And that was all the way through the primaries, 30, 40% of voters. 
And if you multiply that by the one third of people who are uh, committed Republicans, that's something like 10% of voters. And so the, when I look at a statement like vote rigging or any of these other things that he says, roughly speaking, I think of that as being about 10% of American voters who like what he says and who've liked it all along. And so when he says there's vote rigging, mm, that would be about 10% of voters who are real hardcore Trump fans. And so, for instance, uh, if he and Paul Ryan get into a spitting match over um, endorsements or over statements that uh, about Captain Khan that Paul Ryan condemns, yeah. um, you know, part of the reason that Paul Ryan is not withdrawing his endorsement of Trump is just survival in November, because about 10% of voters are really Trump supporters, not just people who vote for him, but people who are with him all along. And that 10-ish percent of, percent of voters, if they get mad, that's a bloodbath for the Republicans. And so I, I, you know, I will often look at these stories and I will read the story and it's, you know, these are interesting stories. It's why we care about politics. But I will, in my head, convert them to numbers and think, yeah, one in nine voters really like that. And, and so there's a thing in my head, there's a voice in my head that says those things as I read traditional reportage. Yeah, I, for me, when I either am in the media discussing this or watching it, the, the two factors for me, which is a bit different, obviously, from what concerns you, is, is obviously the sense of history is often very thin and uh, everything is covered as if it's new. Yes. I think that's a basic in, in the media. And occasionally reporters do try to understand where this comes from or have we seen stuff like this before. And I do believe a lot of journalists and producers want that. But generally, I think the story in the end comes out as this is the first time we've seen everything. So you have a thinness of yeah. understanding the dynamics behind what's going on. And there's also from a social science perspective, often very little attention to what's more boring to report on, but the institutional factors going on that are pushing politics in one direction or another. The, the bias is clearly toward the person, the personality, the moment. And so you don't, a story about why we have polarization right now and why Donald Trump has some comfort level unless he totally implodes uh, what's going on in the electorate and what leads to the kind of poll numbers you're talking about and why are the parties so rigid and uh, unable to move uh, across the aisle. It just doesn't receive a lot of attention unless you read someone like Ron Brownstein uh, or a handful of reporters who give space to that. Um, and I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what the solutions are because the commercial aspect of the media makes some of this difficult to do and the time you have one minute on air but it's not like this. but it's not like it's that hard to have that knowledge in no. in background while one is talking about these things look i i can in 2 minutes tell a room full of reporters or in 5 minutes say um, there's a lot of polarization in politics and you've been hearing about this a lot in terms of issue positions one way it plays out is that public opinion doesn't move very much and in the last four elections it hasn't moved more than 5% in either direction, or uh, a total range of 5% during a campaign, and that's incredibly narrow. When you look at, say, Reagan versus Carter, opinion moved much more. Eisenhower's uh, campaigns, even then, opinion moved during uh, the campaign. And so it, it feels like it wouldn't be so hard to just be aware that we're in this weird per period of uh, parties choosing up sides, being frozen into position, and voters being frozen with them. and there's a lot of stuff that goes with that. I mean, there's this, there's actually a pretty big picture of polarization that involves that. It involves issues having to do with redistricting, uh, Supreme Court appointments, all kinds of things where, um, where government is breaking. And, um, and that's something that actually is, I don't know, I think it's an interesting story when you're, uh, when your national government breaks. I, I'm personally interested in that, and I'd like to know how often that happens. Yeah, that's a case where you can cover this story. Uh, one way would be just to cover some of the key people right now and why they can't get along and why there's such friction between a Paul Ryan and an Obama in the next administration. The other would be to cover the story you're, the way you're saying. What's really going on that in 2016 uh, we seem to be reaching a point of dysfunction? Uh, 
and why, as you said earlier, which I think is a big story, why is one party breaking apart uh, or not functioning, not functioning the way we expect it to? Uh, I haven't seen a lot on that, but it's really an important part of understanding the Donald Trump phenomenon. I wanted to spend a couple minutes to ask you a question I thought would be uh, interesting to our listeners in terms of have you see, what's one interesting poll this week that you've seen uh, that caught your eye and that you think is significant? Oh gosh, one interesting poll. Well, considering that I consume these things like popcorn, uh, let's see. So I'm going to cheat and I'm going to spend 10 seconds on one and then talk about the one that's really interesting to me. I think people who are just interested in horse race This is a rigged coverage, podcast. Yes, yeah. it's rigged. Right. Um, in terms of just simple horse race, I think one attention catching one is a recent survey showing a tie between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in Georgia. And that is not a state that one thinks about as being a tie, but it, it continues a pattern of, uh, of both candidates being weaker than expected in states that their party won four years ago. And on the Republican side, that weakness is about eight or nine points on average. And so I'm interested in the fact that Georgia is competitive at all. And so just from a horse race perspective, that's kind of interesting. But I don't think it actually matters very much um, because I, you know, my whole credo is to, to look at all of the polls at once. But I would say the other poll that I'm watching is something that's not very well covered, which is the generic congressional preference poll. And this is a question like, if you, the voter, were to choose a Democratic or Republican candidate for Congress, which party would you choose? And that's an interesting one because even though it doesn't name candidates specifically, it does ask about party preference for Congress and it does an okay job of predicting the, uh, the eventual national vote. And in the last several weeks, I saw it up at Democrats plus 7%, which just to put it in perspective, if Democrats won the national popular vote by 7%, they would probably retake Congress. Not definitely, but probably um, for various reasons having to do with gerrymandering and population patterns. That number dipped uh, before and during the Republican convention down to Democrats plus 3%, which is, um, which is not so good. And it seems that they would, uh, Democrats would, would stay out of power in the, in the House. And in the last week, I've seen it bounce back up to 5%. And these are aggregates I'm talking about, medians of multiple pollsters. And so I'm watching that, and it, it's, it's going down a, a lot, and it's come back a lot. And it's hovering up around Democrats winning the national popular vote by 5% at the level of congressional races. I'm watching that one really closely because I think that um, a lot of people are saying that, that the House is out of reach for Democrats. And they have good reasons that they are evaluating individual races. But I'm looking at that number, and I am smelling something. And I'm, I'm like some old dude with, like, bad joints. And I, I feel something in my knee. And I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know. Could be a good year in the House for the Democrats. Not sure yet. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm right. thinking so – that's the thing I'm thinking about. Those are, those are two, two good things to think about. Well, that wraps up our episode. And uh, join us next week when we'll continue with our discussion. Thanks for joining us, and we'll be back soon on Politics and Poll. Thank you all.